Hi everyone, welcome to The Enthusiastic Buddhist. In this video, I'm continuing on from where I was discussing the concept of no self or selflessness. If you haven't seen that video, you might want to go and watch that one first, otherwise this one possibly won't make much sense. In this video, I want to look at several things. I want to explore what the Buddha's position was in regards to the idea of reincarnation and souls and how consciousness continues from life to life. Also, how karma plays a role in our experience, why the Buddha never actually defined in certain terms what our true nature is, and what are some of the things he did say about our experience of being enlightened. Now, in my last video, I explained how we have the five aggregates of form, consciousness, the consciousness based on the sense organs, feelings, perceptions, and mental formations, which work in combination with each other. And because they seem to work so seamlessly, we incorrectly identify with these aggregates as constituting a permanent and unchanging self. So the Buddha pointed out that it's our identification with these aggregates which is basically creating this illusion of permanency and as long as we continue to cling to these as being who we are, we will continue to suffer. So if we're not our bodies, our names, our thoughts and our feelings, then what are we? Well, in the last video, I went over some sutras where the Buddha explained that when there is no clinging to these five aggregates, then what remains is an unrestricted awareness that is luminous all around. So there's this kind of continuity of consciousness, but it's not something that can be pinned down as a permanent unchanging entity or self because it is changing moment to moment. Now, because the Buddha taught that we're constantly in a process of change and nothing can be pointed to as a permanent self, he didn't actually teach a belief in the notion of souls because to believe in a soul means something permanent and identifiable needs to be traveling from one life to another. He did teach that we do have multiple lives and that there is some continuity and connection between them. But he also taught that there isn't anything solid that is transferred from this body into the next life body. So an important distinction in Buddhist teachings is that the Buddha taught about rebirth, but he didn't teach about reincarnation because reincarnation implies that a soul or lasting entity takes rebirth in another body. Now during the Buddha's time, this would have been quite a difficult concept for some people to understand because the idea of souls or there being a self was so prevalent in other religions. There was one occasion when the Buddha was approached by a wanderer named Vachagota who came to see the Buddha and he asked the Buddha whether self existed or did not exist. And the Buddha didn't answer his question, he simply remained silent. Then when Vachagota got up and walked away, Ananda, the Buddha's attendant, asked the Buddha why he didn't reply. And the Buddha said, Ananda, if I being asked by Vachagota the wanderer if there is a self were to answer that there is a self, that would be conforming with those Brahmins and contemplatives who are exponents of eternalism the view that there is an eternal, unchanging soul. If I, being asked by Vajragata the Wanderer if there is no self, were to answer that there is no self, that would be conforming with those Brahmins and contemplatives who are exponents of annihilationism, the view that death is the annihilation of consciousness. If I, being asked by Vajragata the Wanderer if there is a self, were to answer that there is a self, would that be in keeping with the arising of knowledge that all phenomena are not self? No, Lord. And if I, being asked by Vachagata the Wanderer if there is no self, were to answer that there is no self, the bewildered Vachagata would become even more bewildered. Does the self I used to have now not exist? So the Buddha had to be very mindful that some people who already clung to a strong notion of self would be very confused if he was to say that there was no self because they might understand the Buddha as teaching annihilationism and saying that nothing exists. But that wasn't what the Buddha was trying to teach at all. Instead, what the Buddha emphasized again and again is that the self we perceive ourselves to be 
through this identification of the five aggregates and our ego is an illusory one and that beyond this restricted identification there is some kind of continuum of consciousness that exists but it's not like a permanent soul that transmigrates from one life to the next. Now to try and help you understand how this continuity exists between our lives but doesn't mean that something permanent is coming from the previous life into this one, one way of illustrating this is to look at these mala beads for instance. As you can see each of the beads are separate so in this example let's imagine that each bead is a representation of a different lifetime and so I guess a different body. So let's say this bead is my current life now and this bead is one of my previous lives. Now although these beads are different lifetimes and they're separate, you can see that there is a common string that runs between them, connecting them. So this string is like our mind stream or continuity of consciousness. And so you can see that the piece of string that is running specifically under this bead is not the same piece of string that's running under this bead. So in the same way, consciousness hasn't come from this lifetime and been transplanted into this one, yet there is some continuity between them. They are still connected in some way. So the person I am today is not the same person I was in a previous life but there is still some relationship happening there. There is still some continuity. So when the Buddha spoke about his previous lives, he didn't believe that his personality or soul from a different body had been plucked out and placed into his new body. Conventionally, he had to use the words I, me and mine, but he only used these terms for convenience really because he knew at an ultimate level that there was no permanent self or ego or solid entity that was being carried across each lifetime. So what are the characteristics of this consciousness that is carried over from moment to moment or from one life into another? Well, to explain what happens at the moment of death, I want to turn to a formidable scholar of the 5th century named Buddha Gosha he organized the Buddha's teachings from the Kapali Canon into a comprehensive manual called the Visuddhi Marga, which explains how to use the teachings in the Pali Canon as a step-by-step -step guide for reaching enlightenment. And in this guide, it explains how when the last moment of consciousness of our current life terminates, it, it, is, it is immediately replaced by another moment of consciousness which is known as rebirth linking because it links the previous life consciousness with the next one. But because it is a new moment of consciousness, nothing substantial has actually passed over from the past life and neither has this consciousness simply arisen out of nowhere. One analogy that's used to illustrate this continuity of consciousness is that it's like a document seal imprinting on hot wax. You know how in the old days they would have those wooden stamps, they would have some kind of seal or imprint on the bottom of it so that when you pressed it into some red wax that same imprint would now appear in the wax. Well as you can see from this example the imprint in the wax only arises due to the cause of the seal but nothing substantial has been transferred from the seal. I mean the seal hasn't lost part of itself, it's still intact so nothing in effect has transferred over. So in the same way, the same thing happens with each moment of consciousness. Each moment of consciousness is produced respectively from the former moment of consciousness, yet nothing solid has transferred over. In another example, we can use the analogy of an echo. So when you're standing at the top of the Grand Canyon and you yell out, hello, you'll hear the echoes saying, hello, hello. But those echoes have only come into existence because of the original source, which was our voice. But obviously nothing substantial of our voice has been carried over or transferred over because we haven't lost our ability to speak, nor have we lost part of our vocal cords. And another analogy that can be used is how one candle lights another candle. 
This particular analogy is found in a different Buddhist text called the Melindapana, which is a compilation of questions asked by the King Melinda to the great Buddhist teacher named Nagasena. And on one occasion, the king asked Nagasena about whether anything is transferred from one life to another. So the king asked Nagasena, does Venerable Sir rebirth take place without transmigration? Yes, O King. But how, Venerable Sir, can rebirth take place without the passing over of anything? Please illustrate this matter for me. If, O King, a man should light a lamp with the help of another lamp, does the light of the one lamp pass over to the other lamp? No, Venerable Sir. Just so, O King, does rebirth take place without transmigration. So as you can see in this example, when one candle lights another candle, the second candle can only be lit depending on the first one, but the original flame hasn't transferred over. The original flame is still intact and no less of a flame. So basically what these analogies are trying to illustrate is that each moment of consciousness depends on the previous moment or moments, but nothing solid is being carried over from one moment of consciousness to another which we could call a permanent entity or a permanent self. And what these teachings also point out to us is that death is not something to be feared. It's merely the continuation of one moment of consciousness to another. In fact, we're being reborn moment to moment. Death is not the grand finale. It's simply a replacement of one body for another. Now getting back to why the Buddha didn't want us to get lost in the delusion of a permanent self is because one of the downfalls of believing in a permanent self is that we're going to continue to create negative karma because when we have a belief in self then we generate all our fears, cravings, attachments and aversions and this karma which is our volitional actions has this kind of energy or push which gives the impetus for this flow of consciousness which is what allows us to continue from life to life. In response to another one of King Melinda's questions, Nagasena explained this connection between rebirth and karma. The king asked Nagasena, What is it, Venerable Sir, that will be reborn? A psychophysical combination, Nama Rupa, O King. But how, Venerable Sir, is it the same psycho-physical combination as this present one? No, O King, but the present psycho-physical combination produces karmically wholesome and unwholesome volitional activities, and through such karma, a new psycho-physical combination will be born. So Nagasena explains here that our present actions of our body, speech and mind influences the future conditions of our physical and psychological makeup, which is what makes karma so liberating because it means that basically we're creating who we are moment to moment. And this is what makes enlightenment possible because if we practice meritorious and wholesome deeds, will be moving that much closer to developing a mind that's capable of awakening. But if we continue to create unwholesome and negative karma, such as clinging to a belief in a permanent and inherently existing self, we'll only enhance our cravings, our attachments, and craving is the prime ingredient for us remaining unenlightened and stuck in samsara. If it helps, you can think of karma as being like a spinning wheel which projects us into each new rebirth. And that karmic wheel is powered by our craving and underlying that craving is the subtle defilement of ignorance, this ignorance of grasping to an illusory self. So the whole goal of meditation in Buddhism is to develop insight into our true nature and be freed from our grasping to the aggregates of self. It's only when our minds are calm and concentrated enough that we will see who we really are. And once we have this insight or realization, our ignorance of our ignorance and belief in a permanent self is completely uprooted and will no longer create contaminated karma. So it's the seed of ignorance that needs to be destroyed by our wisdom of seeing our true nature. And once we have that wisdom of realizing selflessness, 
then we'll no longer grasp at things as belonging to us and we'll no longer suffer because of our attachments and cravings and we'll no longer be stuck in the cycle of samsara and uncontrolled rebirths and being at the mercy of our karma. So in essence, all suffering falls away when we have an insight into our true nature. Now, although the Buddha did mention this quality of us having a luminous and unrestricted awareness, he never really explained what happens to an enlightened being after they die. So he never really explained what constitutes our true nature. I mean, when questioned, he was reluctant to say whether an enlightened being existed after death or didn't exist or both existed and didn't exist or neither existed nor didn't exist. And the Buddha's reluctance to explain this is actually a great teaching in itself because it points out that it's only because we cling to concepts and certainties that we feel the need to describe what exists after awakening. But the truth is, is that enlightenment is, an enlightened being is beyond concepts. And when we have the realization, there is no desire to describe it. There's a dialogue between Sariputta and Mahakothita that illustrates this when they said, For one who loves clinging sustenance, who is fond of clinging sustenance, who cherishes clinging sustenance, who does not know or see, as it actually is present, the cessation of clinging sustenance, there occurs the thought, the Tathagata exists after death, or the Tathagata does not exist after death, or the Tathagata both exists and does not exist after death, or the Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist after death. But for one who doesn't love clinging sustenance, who isn't fond of clinging sustenance, who doesn't cherish clinging sustenance, who knows and sees as it actually is present, the cessation of clinging sustenance, the thought the Tathagata exists after death, or the Tathagata does not exist after death, or the Tathagata both exists and does not exist after death, or the Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist after death, doesn't occur. When a monk has been freed from the classification of craving, there exists no cycle for describing him. So here Sariputta and Mahakothita explain that once we stop taking delight in the aggregates of form and perception and we stop being influenced by our craving and our need to become something, then we can completely drop this need to describe what actually exists once a person is enlightened because basically those thoughts simply won't arise in our mind. And all the notions of birth and death are transcended by this stage, so there's no cycle to describe one by. Basically, if we want to know what remains once we're enlightened, we need to have the experience for ourselves. We need to practice the path and become awakened to the reality of things. Then let's see if we can find the words in our vocabulary that are adequate for expressing this experience. I think we'll find that there are no words that will do it justice. So the Buddha wasn't interested in defining our true nature. He was only interested in one thing, and that was to end our suffering. He wanted us to end our illusions and our clinging to the aggregates as being who we are. And he realized that having this insight into our true nature was the only way to achieve happiness a happiness that is actually our birthright. And although he didn't explicitly say what remained after becoming awakened, he wasn't shy of using similes to explain some of the positive characteristics of one who is enlightened. So when describing what awakening and freedom from suffering is like, the Buddha said, the unfashioned, the unbent, the fermentation free, the true, the beyond, the subtle, the very hard to see, the ageless, permanence, the undecaying, the featureless, non-elaboration, peace, the deathless, the exquisite, bliss, rest, the ending of craving, the wonderful, the marvellous, the secure, security, unbinding, the unafflicted, dispassion, purity, release, attachment free, the island, shelter, harbour, refuge, the ultimate.
Now, I don't know about you, but some of those descriptions are very appealing to me, like rest, secure, release. When I think of these words, they conjure up an image of like, you know, falling backwards into your bed after a physically and mentally exhausting day. It's like we can finally let go of all our stress and worry once and for all. And just to re-emphasize this point, that once we have this realization of selflessness, we experience nothing but happiness and joy, I want to end with another passage from the Buddha where he said, I teach the Dharma for the abandoning of the gross acquisition of a self, the mind-made acquisition of a self, the formless acquisition of a self, such that when you practice it, defiling mental qualities will be abandoned, bright mental qualities will grow, and you will enter and remain in the culmination and abundance of discernment, having known and realized it for yourself in the here and now. When defiling mental qualities are abandoned and bright mental qualities have grown, and one enters and remains in the culmination and abundance of discernment, having known and realized it for oneself in the here and now, there is joy, rapture, serenity, mindfulness, alertness, and a pleasant, happy abiding. So I hope you can see that the Buddha was only interested in one thing, and that was to try to help us experience the same state of joy, rapture, and serenity which he discovered. And through his teachings, he taught us what actions lead to happiness and insight, and what negative actions or wrong views should be abandoned. And of these wrong views, the most important was the teachings on selflessness or anatta, meaning we shouldn't hold to our five aggregates as being a permanent self. Because once we've got a self, then we're going to create all those unwholesome volitional karmas on top of it. But fortunately, until we realize selflessness, we still have an ability to change because every moment we are creating our future. Everything we do now imprints on our consciousness. So we can choose to engage in positive and meritorious karma, which will shape our lives in a positive way. And not only will practicing virtue generate present happiness for ourselves and others, it will help to speed us along the path to experiencing this great peace and everlasting happiness that the Buddha spoke about. So that's all for me for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Please remember to subscribe, like and share and also visit my website enthusiasticbuddhist.com for more on Buddhism and meditation. So take care everyone, have a great week and I hope to see you in the next video.